Well, hello there. It's your old buddy, Admiral Teague. And today, we're going to be doing a case study in insanity. Join me as we take an extended look into the mind of J.J. Abrams. All right. I have just endured the absolutely unendurable, ladies and gentlemen. I have spent the last 18 minutes listening to J.J. Abrams' TED Talk. It is from 2007. So J.J. Abrams in 2007, he was born in roughly 1965, so he's 38 years old. Uh, he's a boy genius at this point. He's a boy genius. Lost is on TV. It has not come to its unsatisfying conclusion. He, his reputation is unsoiled. J.J. Abrams at the time of this speech is essentially, he's, he's done no wrong. He's just the guy who wrote Regarding Henry and has the number one show on TV, which is a compelling Twin Peaks-like mystery called Lost. Lost is a show that was number one every year that it was on. And they missed the season because J.J. got a little confused and had to uh, buy some time. I don't know if he took a year off or shifted us to another location, but there was like a little bit of a... Mexican hat dance there right away with the uh, with 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 Lost within a couple of years, but Lost was a mystery, billed as being a Twilight Zone, David David Lynch like look into a sublime and bizarre set of circumstances stemming from a plane crash. Now, after several years, he had piled mystery on top of mystery. The way that they do in anime movies when they have one mech oppose another and the mech gets stronger and stronger, it's like, we're going to lose, you know, they have Robo Mech 1. Don't worry, we have Robo Mech 1 Turbo. And Robo Mech 1 Turbo messes up Robo Mech 1. And then the next week they're like, you know, Robo, Robo Mech 1 is now obsolete and so is Robo Mech Turbo. They have Super Mech. And they're like, don't worry, we have Ultra Mac and Ultra Mac. And they, it just escalates every week. And there's no real end to it. It's, you know, it's a story of an arms race. And anime is watched for different reasons. It's watched for great art. It's watched, you know, not as much for the story as some other things. Although there are a lot of good anime with a lot of good stories. Please don't attack me if you're an anime fan. I, I, I feel your pain. And I think that anime is great. But what's just talk about J.J. Abrams and his undue influence on our life. J.J. Abrams is going to tell us now about how he learned how to make movies as an extremely wealthy, entitled Midtown Manhattan kid. Let's, let's hear this story, shall we? And I said, listen, you know, what, what should I talk about? Uh, he said, don't worry about it, just, just be profound. That is J.J. in a nutshell. It's not true profundity, though. He just seems profound. <laughs> and I, uh, I took enormous comfort in that, so thank you if you're here. Okay. Yeah, I mean, JJ, by the way, in this TED Talk, it's 18 minutes of him uh, kind of going uh, sort of stream of consciousness. And it, at times, he can really start to get to you and bring, bring you to a place of unpleasantness. He can sort of traumatize you a little bit. Um, I, I don't know how else to put it, but let's, let's rejoin the great J.J. Abrams. I'm trying to think, what do I talk about? It's a good question. Uh, why do I do so much stuff that involves mystery? And I started trying to figure it out. And I, I started thinking about, well, why do I do any of what I do? And I started thinking about my grandfather. I loved my grandfather. That is key right there. All right, listen. He had a really good relationship with his grandfather, which everyone should have. But uh, he took away all the wrong lessons, which is a J.J. Abrams trait and a trait of all of his skions. He was an amazing guy. And one of the reasons he was amazing, uh, after World War II... By the way, does anybody know what J.J. Abrams' grandfather's name was? I started thinking about, well, why do I do any of what I do? And I started thinking about my grandfather. I loved my grandfather. Harry Kel At least... He's normal enough 
to have loved his grandfather. His grandfather who? Yeah, so thank you if you're here. I was trying to think, what do I talk about? It's a good question. Right. Uh, why do I do so much stuff that involves mystery? And I started right. to figure it out. And I, I started thinking about, well, why do I do any of what I do? And I started Indeed. to tell my grandfather. I loved my grandfather. Harry Kelvin uh, was his name. Kelvin. Kelvin. Kelvin timeline in Star Trek. The USS Kelvin in Star Trek 09. Um, there's mentions of the Kelvin Ridge in The Force Awakens. He must use the word Kelvin in every movie. He has OCD that way. It's a nice tribute to his grandfather. It would be nicer if we found out in a book after he retired, though. He's been ramming this one home since this speech in 2007. His name, my mother's father. He died in 1986. He was an amazing guy. You know what? He was an amazing guy. Because he was definitely a nice grandfather. But his real genius, what made him money and what made, helped make young J.J. Abrams quite so wealthy and helped him live the life of quite so much luxury, is that uh, Harry Kelvin was a genius of repurposing. And what he did was he found some garbage, literal garbage, that was uh, you know, left over from World War II. Things like vacuum tubes, primitive circuit boards, uh, things of that nature. And he would put together science kits and sell them to kids at school. And J.J. really took all the wrong lessons from that. Let's, let's listen to J.J. And one of the reasons he was amazing, uh, after World War II, he began a, uh, an electronics company that he started. Um, so it was actually an educational company. Selling surplus parts, kits to schools and stuff. See how he fundamentally misunderstood his favorite person's actual job? So he had this incredible curiosity. As a kid, I saw him uh, come over to me with uh, radios and, and telephones and all sorts of things, and he'd open them up. He'd unscrew them. Now, there is a little... That is slightly interesting, but, I, you know, I don't know about mind-blowing. You you've seen the inside of one circuit board. Unless you learn how to wire them, you've seen them all. If you've seen one vacuum tube, unless you learn what they used to do and how they worked, you've seen them all. Them ...and reveal the inner workings, which... Many of us, I'm sure, take for granted, but it's an amazing gift to give a kid, to open up this thing and show how it works and why it works and, and what it is. He was the ultimate uh, deconstructor in many ways. And my grandfather uh, was, a, was the kind of guy who would not only take things apart, but he, he got me interested in all sorts of different odd crafts, like um, you know, printing, like the letterpress. I'm obsessed with, with printing. I'm obsessed with silk screening and, and book binding and box making and I, I was when I was a kid I was always like taking apart right boxes and stuff and last night in the hotel now this this really is this is a dumb moment I'm I'm sorry uh, I have to describe it what JJ has done here to fill time in his TED talk before he gets to several videos in a row only one of which has anything to do with him and all of which have very little dialogue and just seem to be filled with explosions except for the take from Jaws, um, he's taking out the box of tissues from his hotel room, which he has carefully unpeeled to show that, yes, in fact, the tissue box is a masterpiece of uh, practical engineering and origami by somebody who had, like, some kind of uh, design degree. Okay, it is a really fascinatingly well-made paper box, just like the vacuum tube is fascinating. If you're six... For a short period of time possibly even hypnotic but jj at this point he's like 38 years old grown man and here he is waving around a, a tissue box that he's disassembled uh in his hotel room as he tried to to come up with ideas for uh his ted talk so i took apart the kleenex box i was looking at it and i'm telling you this <laughs> it's a beautiful thing i swear to god i mean a tissue box. Not a functional and amazing thing. Not, you know, kind of a, a, a marvel of uh, use of materials, you know. Nothing, no observation except that as a box itself, it's beautiful. I mean, I mean, when you look at it, look at the, the box and you sort of see how it works. It's Reeves is here and, and I met him years ago at a book fair. He does pop up. Right. Like, like engineering of paper. But like the scoring of it, the printing of it, where the thing gets glued, you know, the registration marks for the ink. I just love boxes. My grandfather was sort of the guy who, 
you know, kind of got, got you know. these things. He would also supply me just with tools. He was this amazing the box. What's inside the box is just there. You don't have to understand it. This is a recurring thing. This is very similar to something that we saw back in the 90s when the United States uh, did Operation Desert Storm. And J.J. was like, you know, whatever, like 30 at that point. So he was like really paying attention. He was probably fascinated with that war on CNN. And his mystery boxes are honestly what I would call more of an unintentional kill box. But anyway, let's hear a little more from the man himself as he misuses the toolbox. Now remember, the mystery box is supposed to be used for detective shows, not for sci-fi. You know, the mystery also needs to be paid off. But J.J. never really seems to be able to pay off a mystery. I would point out that we get a mystery box that's there and ununderstood just because mysteries are in some way a payoff in themselves to J.J. in The Force Awakens when Rey finds Anakin Skywalker's lightsaber. How did Han Solo walks in after afterwards and confronts Ray and asks her, you know, uh, and asks Maz Kanata, where did you get Luke's lightsaber? And Maz Kanata says, that's a good question for another time. And we never get that. And there's two and a half more movies from that moment. Okay, so J.J. doesn't care about telling you what the mystery was. It's not like a well-thought-out mystery movie. It's not a detective story. It's not an episode of Law and Order where they actually say, this is why this happened, and this is why the man in the green suit was standing there, and this is why they seem to have problems uh, you know, maneuvering their vehicle. It's all part of the plan. And they explain it, and they put every piece together, snapping it together like Legos, and it makes sense, and it's called the payoff, and it's satisfying. J.J. only likes to open up and look at things encourager uh this patron sort of uh to make stuff and he got me a, a super 8 camera when i was 10 years old that is a flex that is a flex right there when jj was 10 years old in 1975 this item cost the equivalent of a thousand dollars now and they let a child play with it okay these people had money and in 1976 that was sort of an anomaly to be a 10 year old kid validation from jj right there that access to a camera and you know he was so generous i couldn't uh, believe it he wasn't doing it entirely uh uh without some manipulation i mean i would call him this is key too before jj abrams ever learned how to make a movie he learned how to manipulate people that's an that's an important part of this whole thing and keep it in mind as we go forward J.J. Abrams is now going to try to make his first movie as a 10-year-old. Wait, right? just like Steven Spielberg. It's, it's strange. But listen to how he accomplishes it. I mean, I'd be like, listen, Grandpa, I really need this camera. Um, you don't understand. This is like, I really, you know, I want to make movies. I'll get invited to TED. So urgency and then some inappropriate humor. One day, this is like... <laughs> And, uh, you know, and my grandmother was the greatest because she'd, she'd be like, you know, uh, she'd get on the phone. So his grandfather was reticent to let a 10-year-old play with a $1,000 camera, let alone expose him to the crime in the mid-'70s with $1,000 worth of technology in his hands walking around. Can you imagine Manhattan in the 1970s? Google Manhattan 1976 and see some of those pictures. Don't look at the Bicentennial Parade. I mean, look at it because it's cool. Uh, but look at like the streets, like Google like Uptown Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan uh, 1976. See what that shit looked like. And then tell me that they didn't base the sets from like the blurred out city in every movie since on that. Oh, and she'd be like, Harry, it's better than the drugs. No, that's where I, I actually disagree. Um, as far as J.J. Abrams, I'm not saying that anyone should go out and do drugs, but, but you know, J.J. Abrams, you know, unearned. He's got this amazing piece of technology in 1976 
And he wants it so bad that he's setting his grandparents against each other. What would have been better? Rohypnol, clonopin, Vicodin, and too many other heavy-duty substances to list. Yeah, you know, what? It, that's not too cool to do to your grandparents. Anyway, Inside the Kill Box with J.J. Abrams continues. She, be, she, was, she was fantastic. So, um, so I found myself um, getting this stuff, uh, thanks to her assist, and suddenly... Doesn't that sound like he scored drugs? You know, I had a synthesizer when I was 14 years old. Uh, uh. So he was 14 years old in 1979 or 1980, the year that MTV started. And all the guys in Duran Duran put together scrapping up their money were able to buy like all of one synthesizer. Uh, you know, the other keyboard was like a regular just keyboard, non-synthesizer, piano kind of keyboard. And they were able to spin all those hits off of it, you know, and that was a major investment. And the key, the, a synthesizer in 1979 cost the equivalent of, I would say, for a decent one, anywhere from $6,500 to $8,000 at that time, okay, at that time. So what would that be today? Uh, this kind of stuff. And it, it let me make things, which to me was sort of the, the dream. He sort of humored my... The dream was to make things, not to make beautiful things. Obsessions with other things, too, like magic. The thing... Uh now, this tells us a little bit about J.J. right here. It's his trip to a magic store, and, uh, of course, it's overly wordy, and, you know, I'm flirting with a copyright strike, so we have to put on uh, the, the cover of my PTSD noise here just to keep us out of trouble, but what's hear a few more words from the great J.J. Abrams, and now we're going to talk about magic. Uh, is we go to this magic store in New York City called Lou Tannen's Magic. I've been there. Great magic store. It's a crappy little uh, building in Midtown. All of Midtown was crappy. Um, but you'd be in the elevator. The elevator would open. There'd be this little, small magic store. You'd be in the magic store. Notice how long it takes him to say, I went to a magic store. And it was just, it was a magical place. So I got all these sort of magic tricks. Oh, here, I'll show you this kind of thing. So it'd be like... Okay, now JJ is going to do something re really revelatory, in my opinion, here. He, he knows he's a decent sleight-of-hand card trick musician, magician. He's probably a pisser at parties. And JJ Abrams is all right guy. He just he has had an undue influence on our lives. And he also, smelling his own farts right here, thinking that he's some sort of a genius. Lost is not going to end well. It's universally regarded as the poorest ending of any TV show, worse than the ending of Seinfeld, which merely ended with two bad episodes, not a self-destructive disaster. The ending of Lost was an interpretive ending. There was no payoff to several years' worth of mysteries. It turns out that everything we saw in Lost was a coping mechanism inside the minds of the passengers of the plane that crashed to start the movie, so uh, to start the TV show. So nothing in Lost happened. It was all a, uh, a comforting hallucination as people died. That was the ending they came up with to explain all this stuff. It was a delusion to defy death. Okay, so go ahead, JJ, take us away. Like, you know, right? Which is good, but now I can't move. Now I have to do the, the rest of the thing. I'm like this. There's the like, oh very God. good point. Now... He moves his hand over to his computer and uh, ditches the card. What he does is he pulls the card trick and he explains that, you know, he had very convincingly done it, but now his hand is sort of frozen and he makes a joke as he drops the card that he has palmed surreptitiously behind something else. And uh, this is, you know, sort of a basic sleight of hand thing. But it's, he couldn't help but do it in his presentation. And then he had to make a joke that was only just so funny to get out of it. And there you have the microcosm of the J.J. Abrams narrative. Uh, he's a, when he has a movie, he tries to use uh, humor to offset the action that he's done, whether he should do it or not. Now, in this case, the card trick was sort of appropriate. It was over the top, though. Uh, he could have just explained it quickly instead of doing it and making that joke, but he's just trying anything to do anything but be of substance in this TED Talk where he's being accepted as boy genius. It, this TED Talk has not aged well for J.J. Why have I not opened this? And why have I kept it? Because 
Oh, this is the mystery box itself. He takes so long to get to this. Uh, I'm sorry. Anyway, let me just get you there. That kind of thing. So it'd be like, you know, right? Which is good, but now. I okay, yeah, there's his car track. I, I got to just kind of talk over this because. I'm like, oh, wow, look at my computer over there. This is anyway. a transformative interpretation so one of, the things that of I how J.J. Abrams this. does Canon's these mystery things. Magic box. The premise behind the mystery magic box is the following $15. Fifteen dollars buys you fifty dollars worth of magic. magic, which is a savings. That's a savings. <laughs> now I bought this decades ago, and I'm not kidding. If you look at this, you'll see uh, it's never been opened. But I've had this. Now this is forever. actually now, the strangest thing ever. Is that I don't believe JJ on this one so, so much. JJ says that he has had this mystery box since 2000 and. Uh, since like 1979 and never opened it. I think he bought another one on eBay. I think he's opened several mystery boxes and knows what's inside of them, but he's just, he's being a pseudo intellectual here and he's talking about the mystery box like it's some sort of genius thing. So let, let's, let's let JJ proceed. Office and it, as it always is on the shelf. And I was thinking, why have I not opened this? And why? I would indeed ask why. He has not opened the mystery box. Let's go a little further with the great J.J. Abrams. I kept it because I don't. I'm not a pack rat. I don't keep everything. But for some reason, I haven't opened this box. Because it's the only way to get fifty bucks worth of value out of fifteen dollars is to spend thirty-five years thinking about and it. I, was, I felt like there was a key to this somehow in talking about something at Ted that I haven't discussed before and, and just bearing a soul for a soul at Ted bored people elsewhere so I thought maybe there's something with this I started thinking about it and, like, and there was this giant question mark I love the design for what it's worth of this thing and uh, I started thinking why haven't I opened it and I realized that I haven't opened it now you can see the mystery box right there um, on the uh, in the browser window he's extremely proud of uh, his mystery box and as you look at the picture of J.J. Abrams that I provided for you here, you know, it very much is a picture of a guy dressed for 2007 when he was on top of the world. I would argue that it's been downhill ever since because that ending of Lost, if that had happened before he got a movie script, that would have ended him. He had a movie deal to do Star Trek before he let that Lost ending be so horribly bad. He really screwed everybody over. And there's a reason why a show that rated number one for like every season it was on is never in reruns. Fine, lost in reruns. No one cares because they found out it was all BS, an interpretive ending. Make of it what you will. He literally told people who'd spent years watching his show, make of it what you will. Uh, and that disingenuous misrepresentation and use of a detective story motif, the whodunit motif, for something other than a detective movie is usually going to end up vaguely unfulfilling. The Force Awakens is a vaguely unfulfilling movie, to say the least. It's also contrived and convenient and filled with awkward card tricks that have to be bought off with a joke. But what's what J.J. Abrams, boy genius of 2007, go on? Because it represents something important to me. It represents my grandfather. Am I allowed to cry at Ted? Because, no. And that's the thing. J.J. knows that there's something inside the mystery box, even if he doesn't open it. it. Represents his grandfather. And I have a similar gift. It's not a mystery box. It's just a simple uh, hummel from my grandfather who I called Pop-Pop. And, you know, um, I cherish it. I can't uh, have it at my apartment. I keep it at my mom's place uh, in a safe because I value it so much. It has no value. It's kitsch. It's uh, just something he gave to me right before uh, he passed on. So I understand this kind of sentiment. But what J.J. doesn't get is that we don't know it. We don't know that a mystery evokes in him an emotion because his grandfather loved mysteries. And we don't know it's because he misunderstood that his grandfather owned an education company and thought his grandfather owned an electronics company. His grandfather was a really good entrepreneur and a really nice grandfather. But, I mean, 
I wish he had held on to that camera and let JJ do drugs. And what drugs they were afraid JJ was going to do when he was 10 years old is beyond me. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go. Uh, but, um, but the, <laughs> the thing is... Isn't he just hilarious, ladies and gentlemen? ...is that, that it represents infinite possibility. That's good if you're making the first movie a three movie uh, series, but you need to know if you're going to make a trilogy, you have to have the end planned out. You want to see an ad hoc trilogy with no planning? J.J. Abrams' Disney Star Wars trilogy. The second movie, the most controversial, uh, maybe, is made by someone else, Ryan Johnson. But the first and third movies are J.J. Abrams. The Star Wars Disney trilogy is... J.J. Abrams. Uh, the Force Awakens and The Rise of Skywalker are the work of J.J. Abrams. J.J. Abrams, two sequels, Star Trek Into Darkness and Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker are very similar and two of the worst movies ever made. The idea that you have a mystery is viable in a show like Law & Order because at the end of the episode, they pay it off. J.J. wants a mystery for a sake of a mystery. It represents hope. It represents potential. And what I love about this box, and what I realized I sort of do in, in what... He loves this box because he loves his grandfather. I'm sorry. I'm just fighting the copyright strike here, people. Whatever it is that I do, is I... I oh, jeez, does he ever long-winded. ...infinite possibility and that sense of potential. And I realize that mystery is the catalyst for imagination. Now, This is true, but you have to pay it off. It's not the most groundbreaking idea, but when I started to think that maybe there are times when mystery is more important than knowledge... That is very important. I started getting interested in this. And so I started thinking about Lost and the stuff that we do, and I realized, oh my... Mystery is more important than knowledge. Oh my God, like mystery boxes are everywhere in what I do. And how in the creation of Lost, Damon Lindelof and I, who... Uh, what he's saying in a long-winded way... We, he, what he's saying in a long-winded way is that he wrote himself into a corner on Lost. We were basically tasked with creating this series that we had very little time to do. We had 11 and a half weeks. To write a pilot, he had 11 and a half weeks. There were no ideas kicking around. And he could not come up with a causal agent for what happened on the island in Lost. Um, I would just say off the top of my head, you have to create a mystery island. How would you do it? Um, the island was uh, stumbled upon in the 16th century by Europeans who uh, met some uh, natives of the island. And they all killed each other in various horrible ways. And now the island's evil. I would have at least had that much. And that took me off the top of my head now four seconds to write. J.J. had 11 and a half weeks. He couldn't come up with a causal agent for his island while well, he passes himself off as the next David Lynch. But anyway, let's return to J.J. To write it, cast it, crew it, shoot it, cut it, post it, turn it in, two-hour pilot. So it was not a lot of time. And right. That sense of possibility, what could this thing be? There was no time to develop it. I'm sure you're all familiar with those people who tell you what you can't do and what you should change. And there was no uh, time. Yeah. It was kind of amazing. And I'm going to tell you so to change a few things now, right now. Who, you know, haven't seen it or, or, or don't know. I'm going to show you this one little clip. This from clip the from the pilot show. is so long and so noisy and so insane. Uh, I can't believe that he goes ahead and plays us this much. Uh, it's just, it's nothing but screaming and explosions for like two minutes. And uh, then we find out that JJ doesn't give a shit about the story. He'll do anything for the shot. And the shot is of a plane crash and chaos and fire and people screaming. No dialogue. And in, in the middle of it, to accentuate the horror... A guy gets sucked into the still spinning jet engine, which then explodes. And this is like hard R rated stuff. Thrown into this scene, we get Tom Cruise's lookalike cousin, Thomas Mapo, there go on IMDb. He's also a good actor in his own right, or is it William Mapother? The fact is that when you see this guy, he has blonde hair, but he looks exactly like his cousin, Tom Cruise. 
which has both helped him and hurt him in his career. He's not a bad actor. Fact is, though, he looks into the camera during this, you know, as a reaction shot, and he's great. He gives a great reaction. But one of the things going through your mind is you're not it's conscious of the fact that like he looks just like Tom Cruise, but what you know is there's something about this guy and you're like, huh? And that's one thing that JJ Abrams should get credit for is he has the best casting agents in all of Hollywood because they can help sell this stuff. William Mapeth's reaction is amazing. Now, 10 years ago, if we wanted to do that, we'd have to kill a stunt man. So he's talking about how he uh, used CGI to enhance the plane crash. Actually, Isn't he a riot? It would be harder. It would take take two. Would be a bitch. So the amazing thing was we were it's able to do this It's not thing that and, and amazing, amazing anymore. This speech hasn't aged very well for JJ. Availability technology, knowing we could do anything. I mean, we could. Drunk on the power of CGI. We could never have done that. We might have been able to write it. We wouldn't have been able to depict it like we you did. And so part of the amazing thing for me is... Definitely could write it. ...process, technology is, like, mind-blowingly inspiring to me. I realized... All right. Now, there's an admission to keep in mind. Blown away by technology. So he thinks that we feel the same way because he doesn't have the ability to think beyond his own uh, self. He's not a bad person but he is very self uh, oriented and self centered and uh, he doesn't have a very good understanding of other people and that's why uh, we've seen some of his villains and his heroes act so dumb they're only as smart as JJ that 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 blank page is a magic box think about that for a minute that blank page is a magic box Luke Skywalker's lightsaber at Maz Kanata's casino never gets explained when Han Solo asks us what it is. She says, good story for another time. We never find out. You know, it needs to be, you know, filled with something fantastic. I used to have the order. That's the problem. J.J. doesn't understand that. Ordinary it people script. I'd flip through it. The romance of the script was amazing to me. Now, Ordinary People is a movie where he only thinks there's a mystery in, in it. There is no mystery in Ordinary People. Ordinary People... There's uh, a tragedy, and it's about how people deal with it, and uh, the, uh, the movie's intention is not to give us a closed ending. It's to show us that there is no real ending to some things. They just go on, and it's how we deal with them. So he, he's applying uh, a standard from a very unique movie that was very good to uh, you know, uh, trying to impose that on an action movie. And he's going to talk about things here he doesn't do, like build character and stuff. And uh, you know, I just... When J.J. gets going like this, it's just, it gets to be a bit of a horror. And he overuses some things, and we all wish that he'd had some different habits, like anything. When ropinol, ro rohypnol, clonopin, right. and too many other heavy drug right. substances. If he had done some drugs instead of making some of these movies, we'd all be better off. If he was a kid and he had taken mushrooms, we would just be so much better off than we are with the J.J. Abrams that we have. And as bad, if not worse, his skions. I mean, the guys who made Lord of the Rings, oh, Payne and McKay, they are absolutely the dumbest guys ever. I mean, they didn't give us a good speech. When they gave us a speech, they didn't give us their best. They didn't give us... They didn't give us anything like this. They didn't give us anything like the speech from Independence Day. When they gave us their movie speech, we didn't get anything like this. Aircraft from here will join others from around the world. And you're right. launching the largest aerial battle in, in the history of mankind. Mankind. Those words should have new meaning for all of us this day. In the history of mankind. All right, that's that's a movie speech. J.J. Abrams, not a, uh, not so much. Just to list on more than a few occasions, I was on all of those at the same time. Yeah, 
Exactly. Anyway, back inside the kill box. When it would inspire me. I wanted to try, try and fill pages with the same kind of uh, spirit and, and, and thought. And the spirit and thought of being a blank page. J.J. Abrams just told us that the blank page is more important, that mystery is as important as knowledge. Mystery it is as important as knowledge. Let's think about that for a second. I don't know if that's true, JJ. I'm sorry. And emotion that that, that script did. So that is, you know, the, 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 I love Apple computers. I'm obsessed. So. Yeah, then he goes on a little rant about computers. Let's see. Uh, he's doing product placement, by the way, something that he knows. He's he's smart enough to do. Uh, he's smart enough to do that. He's he's dumb in some ways, but you know he can stun you with a uh, kooky statement out of nowhere, or God knows, just be as absolutely horrible as possible. But ba back inside the kill box. I don't know. I mean, look at like Star Wars. You got the droids. They meet the mysterious woman. Who's that? We don't know. Mystery box. You know. Those things were explained very quickly. Then you meet Luke Skywalker, he gets the droid, you see the holographic image, you learn, oh, it's a message, you know, she wants to... J.J. seems to have forgotten that we all saw this movie and there was context to that message before it was even sent. We knew that she was in peril and she knew, we knew that she was one of the good guys. You know, find Obi-Wan Kenobi, he's her only hope, but who the hell is Obi-Wan Kenobi? Mystery oh, box. boy, so then you go no. And you, you know what? That mystery box is paid off within about... Uh, we hear Obi Wan Kenobi. We know we hear Obi Wan Kenobi. We know he's a powerful guy. Then you know we have an adventure with the droids, where they end up captured and then reunited in the desert of Tatooine by the Jawas, and then bought by the Skywalkers. And then the story that we had plenty of context for continues with Princess Leia's message. And then we meet Ben Kenobi, who's a best guess by Luke for who the hell Obi-Wan Kenobi might be or might know. So we had context when these things happened. It wasn't that someone took apart a tissue box and held it up in front of us and expected us not to be anything but insulted and to do anything but laugh. But he's done a card trick. He's taken apart a box of tissues, and we're halfway through. Well, it is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Holy shit. You know, so it keeps us... <laughs> we... Obi-Wan Kenobi, from the moment we heard Ben Kenobi to the point Obi-Wan Kenobi says, know him, but of course I know him. He's me. I mean, what is that? 10 minutes? 11 minutes? And it's 11 good minutes where other character and world-building events are uh, occurring? Have you guys not seen that? Uh, another bunch of bad jokes by JJ. Now, um, I am just deeply flirting with a copyright strike here, so... Um, we need to go back into uh, the jungles of Vietnam and a bygone era to sort of uh, mix things up here so that I don't get struck. Because even though this TED Talk is supposed to be free and it's 10 years old, I don't know that someone doesn't own it, but... I'm kind of owning JJ, but I got 15 years of hindsight and evidence. It's huge. Anyway, uh, so, so there's this thing with, uh, with, with mystery boxes that I, I, I started. Is it really gets to the point already. I started feeling like compelled. Then there's a the thing of like mystery in terms of, of imagination. The in All right. Keep the mystery in terms of imagination, but not a payoff. In, in uh, the withholding of information, you know, um, Withholding information. How many times have we seen that? Doing that intentionally is much more uh, engaging, whether it's like the shark in Jaws, if Spielberg... JJ goes on to explain about like Jaws and how the shark didn't work and the problems that he had with that. And uh, it's you know understandable that uh, everyone took uh, the lesson from that it was that mystery had value. But, um, you know... JJ is not paying off his mysteries, and that is something that he doesn't understand. There's a payoff to not seeing the shark. We do finally see it, and when we see it, it's pretty effing scary, and we've had some work done to sort of, like, 
keep us from getting uh, lost and having it be too anomalous. For instance, we know what sharks are in the real world because the sharks are from our world. This crippled family and ultimately this kid who, who can't find his way. Di oh, here's where J.J. condescendingly re-explains the uh, plot of E.T. I skipped a huge uh, piece of uh, video that he put up there of just explosions and screaming with no context to talk about how cool it was. Then what you're really getting. Um, and it's true in, in, in so many movies and stories. I mean, False advertising, key to all J.J. Abrams products. When you look at E.T., for example, E.T. is this, you know, unbelievable movie about what? It's about an alien who meets a kid, right? That is correct. Well, it's not. E.T. is a... This is not true. Listen to this. It's about divorce. E.T. is about a, a heartbroken divorce, crippled family. So J.J. Abrams' take on E.T. is that it's about divorce. No. I mean, the family is, you know, no longer together in E.T., but that was so normal. It was no longer, um, you know, out of the ordinary when E.T. came out. Uh, the premise of E.T. is nothing more that uh, sometimes a child outgrows his toys, but in this case, his toys outgrew him because his imaginary friend was real. E.T. was an actual real alien. Whether there's aliens or not, I don't know, but in E.T., the fact the family is getting divorced is just the background. The same as is in the movie Cujo. A lot of movies have divorce in them. Why? Because divorce is common and real and people understand it. And it's a cheap way to insert pain into a story. Like killing a parent, which J.J. does in every story. Divorces are like a bummer. Thinking about them is a bummer. If you're a child of divorce, it's hurtful. If you're a person who is divorced, it's a bad financial memory, at the very least, even if you didn't have children. So as a plot device, you know, things from the real world work, but, you know, a divorce that's a mystery like Han and Leia, yeah, they're just divorced for the sake of being divorced. J.J. doesn't understand E.T. E.T. is not about divorce. He's confused the B-plot with the A-plot here. And ultimately, this kid who, who can't find his way. Die Hard, right? Crazy, great, fun. His take on Die Hard is completely wrong. Let's go. An action adventure movie in a building. It's a. All right, so it's in it. That part's true. It's a, it's a crazy action adventure movie in a building. About a guy who's on the verge of divorce. He's like. It's about a guy who's on the verge of divorce. That's part of the movie. Showing up to LA, tail between his legs. There are great scenes. Maybe. I don't know how tail between his legs he is. He's Bruce Willis in Die Hard. He's always acting in a, from a pretty strong position. He seems obsessed, if anything else. Not the most amazing dramatic scenes in the history of time, but... Criticizing the work of others. Pretty great scenes. There's a half an hour... All right, he bought it back. ...of investment in character before you get to the stuff that you're, you know, expecting. Now, that's something we don't see in any J.J. Abrams movie, uh, you know, at all. In Star Trek 09, it's just like fast-forwarding through their childhoods to kill some parents later, you know, in a way that makes us feel bad when a Ryder's character is just fridged. Uh, and Star Trek 09 fools us to be a good movie because it's one long beginning. He can't write an ending. He couldn't end Lost. He couldn't end Star Trek. He couldn't make a second installment of Star Trek. And he couldn't do anything, anything at all with Star Wars to make there be any kind of cohesiveness or ending. When you look at a movie like Jaws, the, the scene that you expect, we have the screen, these are the kind of... All right, he shows the, uh, the attack from Jaws where the woman is at the beach. You know, the initial attack in Jaws. And even though we couldn't see the shark, I mean, it's not like we had no context. We just didn't see the shark. We knew there was a shark. Oh, sometimes J.J. Abrams will just, he, he doesn't care about making sense. He will say anything to get through this TED Talk without exposing the fact that he's soon going to be seen as a failed storyteller over and over. His first huge failure is just a couple of years down the road. He already is wondering if he can end this lost story that he could come up with no causal event for. And again, a boat full of Europeans uh, in the 16th century washed ashore on this island and they had a conflict with the natives and killed each other would have been better than no reason at all, which is what happened. The interpretive ending of Lost is the worst ending in the history of television in every list and on every poll. Family, how he's going to, you know, make it work in this new town. This is my one of my favorite scenes ever, and this is a scene. Yeah, the story in Jaws 
is not the story of a guy who's unsure of himself in his new town. That's the B plot. That's to make the sheriff more interesting. Jaws is a monster movie about a guy who has to kill a shark to save a town while there's a dispute and while he's the only one who's being believed, sort of like in the movie High Noon, no one else believes him or believes in him. But and he does it because it's the right thing to do. Die Hard is not the story of a movie, is not the story about a guy getting divorced. It's the story of a guy uh, who is in the right place at the right time to stop a bunch of people from getting killed and at great personal risk. He's heroically doing the right thing because doing the right thing is the right thing to do, and that's the kind of guy he is. John McClane would never let innocent people die because he's a cop and a good cop and a good guy. Oh, boy, let me tell you, the, the amount of video, I, can't, I forgot how much time he spends not talking. This is an 18-minute speech with, like, 30 seconds of information. Rip off the stuff that matters. I mean, look inside yourself and figure out what is inside you. Oh, yeah, he's talking about ripping off people here, uh, and he's saying it like he doesn't do it, so let's hear that again. Here, here it is. Rip off the stuff that matters. I mean, look inside yourself and figure out what is inside you. That's worth hearing one more time. Rip off the character. Rip off the stuff that matters. I mean, look inside yourself and figure out what is inside you. Because Kylo Ren is a ripoff of Darth Vader. You heard it here. Ultimately, you know, the mystery box uh, is, is all of us. So the mystery box is all of us. Um, this is an extremely vague comment that I, it's like. We have listened to 12 minutes of J.J. Abrams speaking here, and it's been like trying to nail Jello to a wall. There's that. Then the distribution. What's a bigger mystery box than a movie theater? So movie theaters are great simply because they're box-shaped. You know, you go to the theater, you're just so excited to see anything. The moment the lights go down is often the best part. Because the movie yeah. that you paid for is about to start. Oh, my uh, God. J.J., what is wrong with you? Just <laughs> circumlocuting here. Movie's like there and it's going and then something happens you go oh and then something else like, mm, and then now it's a great movie. Did you hear how JJ describes a movie? This, that, this, that. This is exactly the problem with JJ's movies. This happens and that happens. It's not this happens because this happens, which makes this happen because of which this happens. So this person changes out of their normal way of doing things and does the right thing or the characters you know bond together because they're friends or people rise up because they're brave and good and you couldn't explain that you have to keep it a mystery which is why in star wars sequels raise just a mystery movie you're along for the ride because you're willing to give yourself to it so to me you've also paid money whether it's that whether it's, you know, a TV, an iPod, a computer, cell phone. He's, uh, he's flexing, by the way, talking about things that were very expensive at that time. Uh, it's funny. Well, uh, I'm, a, as I said, Apple fanatic. and Product placement. One day, about a year or so ago, I was, uh, I was <laughs> signing on online in the morning to watch Steve Jobs' keynote. What a snobbish, you know, because he owns Apple stock, whatever. He's, got, he's just talking about his wealth. Like, I, you know, I have nothing against someone being a good capitalist like Harry Kelvin was and, you know, making some money off of it. I have nothing against somebody making, uh, you know, a good movie. I, I mean, the My Pillow guy is not exactly a genius for picking up um, scraps of memory foam, stuffing them into a bag and calling them a pillow. I mean... Before that, they were garbage that had to go to a toxic waste dump because it's memory foam. It was a decent idea. I don't know if it's genius, and I don't know if the hundred millionth my pillow to roll off the assembly line is genius. Is Mike Lindell a genius? Then in that case, if Mike Lindell's a genius, then J.J. Abrams is a genius and the greatest filmmaker ever because he took leftover other things and garbage, put them into a bag, and called them a movie. Just like his grandfather took a bunch of leftover World War II surplus, put it into a bag, and called it a children's science kit. And that it's in itself was probably an okay thing to do with value. But J.J. has applied this and detective movie uh, storytelling 
to everything he's done, and it's infected different parts of our culture, and it's because he thinks the mystery is more important than the knowledge, and he's spoken again of the beauty of the blank page. Because I always do. And, um, and he came on, he was presenting the video iPod, and what right. was on the enormous iPod behind him lost. Right. I had no idea. And I realized, holy shit. The, again, again like the another the fucking the flex. JJ had to stop in the middle of his TED Talk to talk about the owner of Apple sponsoring the TED Talk and talk about flexing his uh, largesse of owning the Apple stock and talking about what a genius the Apple guy is. And everyone, Steve Jobs was a genius. But then, you know, he's saying, oh, my God, like, look at me. Steve Jobs is inspired by me because I'm a genius. Like, this is like seriously sucking his own dick. By it to sell you know what I mean? It was nuts. So I found it. I wasn't sure. It was all just uh, I'm gonna skip through. I'm sucking sure himself off. Thing. It has nothing to do with anything. Uh, then he shows us another film clip that's another just complete disaster. Not the film clip, but what's going on in it. It's explosions and just in, in, insanity and chaos and screaming. This is something online. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it four or five, six years ago they did this. This is a, an online thing done by guys who had some visual effects. Uh, it's just some decent CGI artists who made a decent CGI thing as good as anything he did. And I bet you he's probably hired these guys by now because J.J. Uh, you know, Abrams, uh, he's a bad storyteller, but he's not a total idiot. He knows how to set, his, set people against each other so he gets what he wants. He learned that from manipulating his grandparents. As stuff I've seen, you know, released uh, from Hollywood, the... Uh, the, the, the most incredible sort of mystery I think yeah, is right. the question of what comes next. All right. So it's always about what's going to happen next week or in the next movie. Because it is now uh, democratized. So now the creation of media is it's everywhere. The That's true. Soon you'll be able to write your well in tw about 20 years. You'll be able to write a fiction novel, dump it into some sort of rendering computer and have a decent visual presentation on the level of like today's video games like that in four hours after you've done writing it the stuff that i was lucky and and, and begging for to get when i was a kid is now you this is the first time he's admitted he was lucky to have these things the truth is you know um he was born into a lot of wealth ubiquitous and so there's an amazing sense of of, of opportunity out there when i think he had too many really expensive, expensive things. If I sound tired, it's because I've had to watch this twice. And he, he really is just all red bulled up. <clears throat> There's not a lot of information in this, but the few things we learn are definitely revelatory and recurring. Think of the filmmakers who exist out there now who would have been silenced, you know, who Actually, the dominance of Disney and media has has silenced and continued to silence a lot of people. They silence their critics. Past, um, it's a very exciting thing. I used to say in classes and you know lectures and stuff. JJ just will not. He, he has to fill 15 minutes, and he only had three video clips. That uh, to someone who wants to write, go write, do your thing. It's yeah, okay. Everyone should write. Um, skipping ahead. Sort of like my dream to be involved, and there were a couple sequences in the movie. Uh, like these uh this is just we need to return to uh a place of horrible conflict so that we can stay out of copyright jail if we're not going there already gosh knows that this stream is not going up for a little while a couple little moments i'll show you oh then we get a few minutes of uh we get a, we get a few minutes of tom cruise movies here as uh, J.J. Uh, self filates I'm just going to say these Tom Cruise action scenes that he's taking credit for and these Tom Cruise, uh, you know, really big cinematog cinematogra cin cinematographic moments, it's because Tom Cruise is like the last huge movie star, as weird as he is, and Tom Cruise can act, and Tom Cruise does his own stunts, and these movies are real. These are not typical J.J. Abrams movies because Tom Cruise has a quality control effect over them and tells J.J. what to do. It's like the third video clip in eight in fifteen minutes. Okay, obviously I have an obsession with big crazy explosions. So my favorite. 
No kidding. Favorite uh, visual effect in the movie is the one I'm about to show you, and it's a. And then, okay, so five video clips, um, and and he is just in love with the CGI. Oh, uh, we're seeing an assassin shooting things up Tom Cruise's nose, and then JJ self plates uh, a little more. Very early on in my career, don't hurt Tom's nose. Yeah, uh, he makes sure to uh, kiss everyone's ring duly here. We can see how well it's paid off for him. And uh, he just keeps on saying one stunningly stupid thing after another. There are three things you don't want to do. Number two is don't hurt Tom's nose. So, uh, Eddie has this guy, and he's the greatest guy, and he's like this really sweet English guy. He's like, yeah, sorry, I don't want to hurt, you know, this is, I'm like, you gotta, we have to make this look good. And I realized that I, we have had to do something because it wasn't working. Oh, jeez. Just as it was. And I, I literally like thought back to what I would have done using the Super 8 camera that my grandfather got me sitting in that room. And I realized that hand oh, didn't have to if be If only he'd, he'd done tough. drugs and instead. And just how hard to push the gun. He wouldn't hurt himself. I don't think you figured this out. I think that Tom Cruise did. Sorry, JJ. I just... I don't believe you on this one. It's a little too clever. It's a little too clever for you. I think we're seeing a little bit of lying here. If we're going to punctuate that moment. Um, just uh, to tell the truth, JJ. Really, just, just tell the truth. The truth will set you free. You've been saying some pretty crazy things. Anyway, we're getting near the end. JJ. Oh, God. You just you exactly. I mean, don't worry, guys. We're getting near the end. Um, we're almost done with a crazy trip down J.J. Abrams Lane. I just have to go to uh, copyright protection uh, school here, so I can see if I can get away with this. But let's hear a little more from J.J. before he wraps up after his fifth or sixth video clip here. So we took his hand and we painted it to look a little bit more like Eddie. Oh, yeah, isn't that brilliant? Tom Cruise uh, used sleep. both uh, hands so out of frame. Yeah. Th this was kind of like something that uh, was competent. It's so what, though? Tom Cruise uh, held a gun on himself and they cut out certain parts of the frame to make it look like it was someone else's hands. I mean, BFD. Again, that's not... Eddie's hand, that's Tom. So Tom is playing two roles. It's not that clever. And he didn't ask for any more money. So here, here, watch it again. That wasn't that funny. There he is, he's waking up. Back to even more video. Um, J.J. Abrams talks a lot, but doesn't say much. Anyway, here's his cum shot at the end here. So you don't need the, the greatest technology to do things that, that can work. Uh, True. It's surprising he would admit that. In movies and uh, the mystery box in honor of my grandfather stays closed. Thank you. <sighs> well, what did we learn? We learned that it doesn't really matter what's inside the box. You just need to have a box. We learn that J.J. Abrams can say some things that are just stunningly, stunningly fucking stupid. We've learned that in 15 minutes, J.J. Abrams needs 15 minutes of... Uh, in 15 minutes, J.J. Abrams needs like seven or eight minutes of video and like four or five props. Apart, but he, he got me interested in all sorts of different odd crafts, like... This, that he that he learned that boxes were a good thing from his grandfather. Um, you know, printing, like the letterpress. I'm obsessed with, with printing. I'm obsessed. JJ has something called OCD. Anyway, it's it's been real inside the mind of JJ Abrams. I think uh, it's best that we do something appropriate by concluding that we will all probably try to avoid the J.J. Abrams movies. We're seeing why Rings of Power had a volcano explode for no reason with no repercussions. Anything to get the shot. 
A mystery is a mystery is a payoff in itself, and a lot of lazy filmmaking, all because of the influence of one man. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll find time to like and follow this stream. This is your buddy, Admiral Teague. It's been for real. I love it when we all get together. I'll be back for things like Rings of Power and the horrible She-Hulk. But until then, it's Admiral Teague signing off.